Yep. Got a nice crew on tonight. Laura, are you from Arkansas? Okay, good. If you don't mind, text me your email address so I can put you on the notifications list if you want to be on there, okay? Laverne Gooding, Canada. Uh-oh. Andrew, Laverne's here. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. Brother Emerson, good to see you. Brother Schober. Shalom. Brother my, my, it's glad to see you. Emerson did a great job last uh, Sunday night with Bob Schnobelin. I hope you got a chance to hear that either live or on YouTube. Man, that video got a lot of hits. Like in the first day, it got 100 hits. That's good, Emerson. You're coming back. The Mo Show is coming back. Sounds good. That means you're, that, you know, that puts a little bit of a, um, something that you have to do. The activist is here. Activist Walter. Don't know who that is. Hello, activist. Are you going to give Andrew trouble tonight? That's okay. Go ahead. He had to get off for a minute because he has a little bit of a broadband trouble up there in Schenectady, Schenectady, New York with all the snow falling down and everything. So he'll be back on in a moment. And uh, I'm afraid to say, or maybe you have the same pro problem, from my desktop, text files disappear about once every two weeks. They just go away. Anybody have that problem? Well, that's where I keep my questions that I get each month. Hi, Walter. And uh, so I'm going to have to go to... Hello. Uh, good to see you again. Yeah. You are an like... activist. <laughs> I remember you. Yeah, me too. Where are you anyway? I'm a professor. I'm, I'm in Queens, New York. Queens, New York. Yeah. Well, we know somebody in Queens. That's uh, Jackson Souffrant. Yeah. I know Queens is just a real little tiny place, and you probably know everybody there, right? Uh, I'm in Flushing. Flushing. Yeah. Sorry, uh, I was trying to figure out my uh, my audio issue, and it turned out I didn't have my uh, microphone and camera oh, well, plugged in. So. Wouldn't you know? Wouldn't you know? Are you ready for a question already? I'm ready to start whenever you are. So. Well, I was telling the group here that my text file with all the questions from October disappeared. <laughs> And so what I have to do is go to fresh questions from November, and I'm looking for them now. Well, also, if people here, I mean, we've got uh, some Yeah. We, we haven't seen in a while, uh, Walter and Laverne, you know, mm, if you want to oh, contribute certain uh, topics for discussion for tonight, that would also be interesting. Cause Andrew, Walter, and Laverne are here. So I've got to warn you, if you've been drinking, <laughs> well, you're going to have a hard time tonight. Mm. Let's ask if there are any questions here. Well, uh, while we're seeing if anyone has anything they want to talk about, uh, what does it look like for November? Like, are there anything, is there anything kind of interesting or is it kind of? Uh, I think they're good. So far, I've gotten about a dozen, and okay. it's only November, like, the, this is the 6th. This is a black letter day for me. Well, let, let's, why don't we start, and then uh, anyone can here can contribute and suggest uh, various topics. All right, we'll start. 
Oh, okay, okay. Uh, I got something in mind. Okay, good. Uh, sc scholars have, have been a little bit evasive with this. Uh, uh, I heard Michael Heiser that talked about it. So my, uh, I got something in mind. Ezekiel talks about uh, the third temple being rebuilt. Oh. And, and when he talks about that third temple being rebuilt, he talks about in he talks about it in a positive way. Like for Israel, there would be uh, burning offers and everything again. And we got we got a uh, Second Thessalonians. We got Second Thessalonians that talks about uh, the, the Antichrist taking the temple, right? So anybody wants to talk about uh, that Ezekiel part? That is, yeah, yeah he, he talks about it in a positive way. Jackson, uh, I'll go first. We, yeah, you go first. All right. First of all, Ezekiel never talks about a future temple. And if I'm not mistaken, he never talks about one in Jerusalem. Um, dispensationalists have been saying all along that that temple is in the future. When I believe, and I think I can prove, it was in the past. 1350 BC, the temple of Akhenaten at Akhenaten. Because Ezekiel and the Dead Sea Scrolls, which scroll? Temple scroll. Both describe, one describes the size of that temple from the inside, and one describes the size of that temple from the outside. And it just so happened that they are exactly the same dimensions as the temple of Akhenaten in Akhenaten in 1350 or so BC. Now, Akhenaten, if you might recall, was a monotheist. And it tells us that he left the capital to go down and build his own city that he called Akhenaten, that is the, uh, the horizon of the sun. And then he brought 50,000 people down with him from the capital city. Those 50,000 people could be nothing other than Hebrews that were in the captivity at that time. And the worship that we know of from the Akhetaten Temple, from the record of the Amarna tablets, is so similar to that of Moses and to that of the Tanakh. Plus, it being monotheistic, plus who else would he have brought down from Northern Egypt, but Hebrews, because they were the only monotheists in Egypt. And you have spreading out from the Akhetaten Temple, uh, numerous Jewish type temples in the area there, including on Yeb or Elephantine Island. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's lots and lots of more clues, including the storage bins of Joseph. Remember when he built up for the famine? All right. So if Ezekiel describes a temple that is exactly the same size as the Akhenaten Temple. I don't know if you know anything about Akhenaten or Akhetaten, but you should. Yes, look yes, that. yes. All right. Uh, and if the Temple Scroll also affirms those same numbers, and you don't find them in the New Testament any place. In fact, in Revelation, it says there will be no temple. I think that he's looking back. Neither one of those those Old Testament references, that I, I call the Temple Scroll Old Testament say that that temple is going to be in Jerusalem in the first place. New Testament says there won't be any temple there. They don't talk about any temple except the second temple of Herod. The, the major thought is that he is reminiscing about an earlier time and an earlier temple. 
and that's all the farther I'm going to go with it from there. Maybe that'll pique your interest to look a far, little farther into that. I've got numerous podcasts on this topic that, that give you the dimensions and all if you're interested, but that's what I see. I don't see a third temple being built in Jerusalem. I can't see it. Although Robert Eisenman says that he thinks as a, he's a Zionist Jew, he thinks that not only it will be built, but his brother will be the one to design it. Peter Eisenman, who is the, the great well-known architect of Israel, will be designing it if he lives long enough, like he's in his 80s now. So that's, that's my answer to it. I hope that it uh, pricks your conscience and you want to look into it a little more. Yes, I, I understand what you're talking about because uh, Moses, Moses, uh, the Egyptian, there's even a book called like that. Yeah. And, and everything that he did uh, in the Pentateuch is Egyptian culture, indeed. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant is Egyptian. Uh, the burning of offerings in the Old Testament it was a pagan exactly. practice as well, and and Yahweh took took back what is his, so he reclaimed all, all those offerings. And uh, there's a lot of Egyptian practice and 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 Jewish and and Judaism. It's very very similar. In fact, Psalm 104. Yes, uh, yes. It dug it up on a wall. Uh-huh. And, and, and Elephantine. Yeah, Elephantine, uh, yeah. It is, 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 is an Egyptian song. Uh-huh. So, want me to share my view? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, uh, no. as you... <laughs> Just my as, opinion. As you guys know, Jackson and I disagree on many topics, but we're good friends, and we value each other's perspectives on different things uh, but so uh, my my, my uh, perspective on the, the temple thing is I actually do believe there will be a third temple and that um, it will be a temple of uh, righteousness now um, maybe I believe it will be a right of righteousness but even if you don't agree with that I think there's a very good chance that there will be a third temple built just because of the um, the zeal of some Jews in Israel who want to build it. Not everybody in Israel wants to build it, but there's enough of a push that whether or not it's of God, I think we're going to see it happen. I don't know when, but I think uh, there will be a push for it. Now, in regards to Ezekiel specifically, in the past, I viewed it as a strict prophecy of the future. But as you, as I tried to make sense of uh, the prophecy and it, you know, evaluate it from a sensible perspective, it actually makes more sense as a commands given to the people at that time. Uh, they were told, you know, they were in exile. They were in exile be and being punished because of disobeying the law. And they were told to when they come back to the land to build the temple and to build it in the proper way and it talked about how the priests are to be righteous there will be sons of zadok and i talked i've talked on this before but i believe that the sons of zadok is a false translation and that it's actually sons of righteousness uh, zadok in hebrew is also the same word that means righteous so Depending how you do the vowel markings, it could be considered a name, or it could be considered the noun righteousness. And so I believe it's talking about the sons of righteousness, because the priests in the first temple period were unrighteous priests. They were idol worshippers, they polluted the temple. Uh, Ezekiel actually describes what the priests had done to defile the temple area they were doing all kinds of abominations in the temple. Remember in the early section of Ezekiel, mm. Ezekiel is shown different things. He's act he actually sees inside the temple 
and he sees them uh, bowing down to the sun and worshiping the sun and, and other things like that. So the prophecy in context is telling them that uh, when they are able to build the third temple, they are to build it according to the requirements of God. And, that, and it gives the requirements and it says the priests are to be righteous and not unrighteous priests. They're to be pure priests. They must be circumcised in heart and flesh because the law requires circumcision of flesh for Israelites and especially for priests. So this, the context is for the, um, for what they were supposed to build. And if they had obeyed that, it very likely would have been fulfilled at that time where, where uh, the surrounding land would have been, you know, because Yah does, did miracles in the Old Testament time. So he would have, he would have uh, created the landscape necessary that Ezekiel describes. So, um, however, as we know, according to various documents of scripture, they didn't build a temple according to the requirements of the law. They built it smaller than they were supposed to. And because of that, the full glory of, that Ezekiel speaks of was not fulfilled. Now, Jackson asks, this is actually a common question that's asked about why will there be animal sacrifices in the future? Um, what's interesting is I actually came upon the, this topic, you know, way long ago when I was still a regular Christian of, um, of Baptists who were saying the law, the law is done away with. And yet they were saying that during the millennial kingdom, animal sacrifices will come back. And I was like, what? This doesn't make sense. So I was reading what the Baptists were saying. And they were saying, you know, they gave their arguments there and you say the Baptists. Yeah, some yeah, some, yeah, Baptist, okay. some Baptists, uh, probably you know along the lines of dispensationalism, right, right. Um, but certainly some Christians don't have a problem with it. They think that sacrifices can exist without undermining the uh, sacrifice of Christ, Messiah. So now, what did the Messiah's sacrifice accomplish, and what did the animal sacrifices accomplish, according to the writer of Hebrews? probably Barnabas, according to the writer of Hebrews, um, we know that the animal sacrifices never atoned for sins. It never took away sins. And yet, the law appears to say otherwise. It appears to say that the animal sacrifices atoned for people's sins. I believe it's a false translation and that the animal sacrifices had nothing to do with sin it had to do with physical impurity of the flesh. The old covenant was very much about the flesh, whereas the new covenant is about more about the spirit. Um, and so the way I see it, um, under the old covenant law, the animal sacrifices are specifically for physical purity, like um, pra basically like taking a bath, essentially. Uh, washing yourself. Um, it has nothing to do with atoning or repenting for your sins. Because if you look in the law, for each type of animal sacrifice, almost none of them have anything to do with sin. And the ones that do, the context seems more to be about purifying the body rather than repentance and forgiveness of sin. Um, so for example, when you have a child that's born, you have to do a sin offering. Why? Because a woman becomes unclean during her period, and it says in the law, after she gives birth, she will be unclean for 40 days or 80 days, depending on the gender of the, of the baby that was born. And on the, uh, at the end of the, that period, the 40 or 80 days, she had to do a sin offering, uh, to purify her body and her, ba her baby's body of the impurity. The, the Gnostics basically taught that when uh, pe people pass on sin through sexuality, and so this idea that 
you are born with a sin nature, you're born into sin, that is very much inserted into the law where it says your sin offering for people who are born. But that, like I said, it's a misunderstanding and it's not a sin offering, it's a purification offering. Uh, there is a scholar called James Charlesworth. He, yes. he uh, is known for translating some of the Apocrypha documents. He's top man. And, in, and he does a series of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, there's a special series for extra biblical texts. Um, and I have most of the volumes. Actually, I have all the volumes that have been released so far. And uh, they're blue books. And in, in the Temple Scroll... Instead of translating as sin offering, he translates as purification offering. So this is a scholarly uh, second witness to what I'm saying, because, you know, I'm not a scholar or academic, so someone might doubt uh, what I'm saying due to my lack of credentials. But we have this top scholar who is agreeing independently. I did not read what he said and then, oh, I like what he said and came to believe it. I theorized it on my own separately, and then I read in his translation the same thing I came upon myself years before that. So I felt that was a confirmation of my idea. Um, obviously, a scholar saying that doesn't automatically validate what I'm saying, but I felt like I was on, uh, I was, um, I had a valid idea because an, another top scholar had a similar idea independently. Um, so, uh, but look at all the other parts of the sin offerings in scripture or sacrifices in general. And you'll see if you have a skin uh, disease or a leprosy, at the end of the leprosy period, when you are healed, you have to do a sin offering. So you, when you're healed of your disease, you give a sin offering. But guess what? You, be, you can get leprosy from someone else without you sinning. You can get it from your parents. You can get it because someone intentionally spreads it to you. Um, just like, you know, if someone had a, uh, a contagious disease and they took a needle and injected it into your, into your veins against your will, you're not a sinner, but you are now defiled and you get that uh, disease. <clears throat> so, okay, Laverne asked about the uh, scapegoat. Um, for the Day of Atonement? Um, yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, so, like, like I said, I believe that there are some sacrifices which appear to be related to sin, but I think it's in the context of specifically purifying the body because when we sin, we also defile our body. So, non-sinful things can defile our bodies. <coughs> but so can sinful things. So if you defile your body, whether it be by sin or without sin, you have to purify your body. But, <coughs> excuse me, we do know the law also says that when there's bloodshed, there needs to be atonement for the earth, specifically atonement for the blood that was shed. And the normal way to atone is uh, the, the murderer's the person who murdered the, the innocent person, their blood is to be shed, and that is an atonement. Um, but if you can't find the murderer, you, <coughs> excuse me, my, I have a itch in my throat at the moment. Um, you find uh, a, you basically take an animal, and that animal is killed in, in the place of the murderer, and its blood atones for the, the land. It's an atoning for the land, if you actually read in the, in the scripture. Um, but for Day of Atonement, it, it says something along the lines of, all the people's sins will be covered. Um, Jubilee, says, Jubilee says the Day of Atonement, Atonement is for the entire year. So it seems like the Day of Atonement was to provide a veil of protection that lasts for the entire year for Israel. Uh, like as a, collect, as a collective whole, it atones for the land of Israel, the nation of Israel. 
the sins of Israel. Um, but the more along the lines of the uh, physical impurity uh, that is caused from the uh, caused from the sins of Israel, not so much atoning for uh, the actual sin, like the spiritual aspect of it. Um, because if, if animal sacrifices did anything in the past in regards to your salvation, you wouldn't need the Messiah because you'd have animal sacrifices. But if you think about it, why in the world would an animal be able to have the power to atone for our sins? Uh, it doesn't make so much sense. But with the Messiah, at least according to the New Testament, uh, the Messiah has divine aspects He's the son of God. And so because he is that, we are able to be atoned through his sacrifice. <clears throat> but uh, so it's my belief that, wait, let, let's see, Laverne uh, said, if animal sacrifices do not cover sins, then what was the purpose of Christ shedding his blood? Uh, are you saying Christ's blood does not cover our sins? If not, does this mean animal sacrifices were not done away with? Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Um, so, so I believe the animal sacrifices will be in the future for uh, physical purification, primarily in regards to holiness, because Israel was called to be a holy nation. The sacrifices were never for the Gentiles, uh, because the Gentiles were never separated as holy. I also believe the church was made holy, but that the church at large is not under all these laws, uh, especially the sacrifice laws. I think there is a special covenant made specifically with Israel. Shows, you know, Israel is actually a holy land, a promised land of, uh, according to Jubilees, there are uh, Places in Israel are the most holy places in the entire world, on the entire planet, Earth. So because Israel's land has the ho most holy places, you need a especially holy nation. And because of that, the animal sacrifices are there to atone for the land, the people living there. And we see this in the Temple Scroll, that the closer you get to the center of the holy place, the more holy you have to be. The farther away you get from the holy place, the less holy you have to be. And by holy, you know, some people think holy means righteous. That's not what it means. Um, but there's, there's overlap. But holiness is not entirely strictly righteous. Uh, it can also just be amoral, nothing righteous or unrighteous, just a setting apart, a unique uh, separation. And so I, so I think that's what it's all about. It's all about purifying and holiness, sanctity. Um, kind of like, like if, you know, when, when Moses was in the presence of God, the burning bush, he took his sandals off because he was standing on holy ground. There's nothing sinful about wearing sandals or shoes. But when you're in the, the, the presence of holiness, you need to remove what's unholy. So he removed the dirt. Uh, the shoes are among the most dirty part of your attire. It, it uh, collects all the dirtiness and germs and gross stuff. So he got rid of that to uh, set himself apart. Um, but what about the Messiah's atonement? Messiah's atonement specifically... Uh, it's in my view that a lot of it was symbolic, but that his death atones for us, his life and his death, um, and not the way he died. So I believe it was very much in the power of the Father to make it so that the Messiah would have lived his years at, till the age of 100 and died in his sleep in peace. And we would have been atoned. I believe the atonement comes from his obedience unto death. So he obeyed the Father and did not violate any of the law until the day he died. 
and he had to be faithful no matter what was given to him. He, unfortunately, he was arrested and uh, essentially murdered by the Romans and the Jews. And if, if he had used his powers to escape that contrary to the will of the Father, then he wouldn't have been able to atone for us because that would have been a sin because he would have disobeyed the Father. And he would have gone beyond what was allowed for him to do. Because when he came to the earth, he was specifically commanded to live like a normal person. So he couldn't go beyond what he was allowed to do. And so um, it was his obedience unto death, I think, that, that uh, saves us from our sins and not specifically the bloodshed of him being murdered on a cross. Um, but the cross was chosen specifically by the Father for the effect it would have on the world, the inspiration it would cause people. It would, it would cause people to be inspired by what happened and lead them to the Bible, to the faith of the Bible, to the church. And uh, I, I think it was, it was a choice of predestination to best impact the world, the choice of how he died on a cross, but that he would have atoned for us any way he died, so long as he was faithful to the Father in dying. I do have other stuff to say about uh, the temple, but uh, I don't want to talk too much. I want to give Jackson a chance um, to say what, if he wants to say something. Jackson, do you have anything you want to say, or did you want me to continue? That, except I, I believe that the life is in the blood. I believe it was the shed blood. I believe that uh, Yahweh sent his son as a demonstration of how cruel it would be to sacrifice these animals of no effect, because I think that he instituted the destruction of animals because that's the worship that those people were used to. They knew no other kind of worship. But according again to Isaiah 1, there was a time when that was going to go off and Yahweh told them through the prophets it was to go off and they just didn't and didn't and didn't. And if you look at the aspect of delivering up your son, like in Abraham, how difficult that would be for a father to do as a demonstration. And then the fact that, well, my theory is, according to Leviticus 17, is that the blood does atone. In fact, there's a, you know, there's a hymn. There's power in the blood, <laughs> power in the blood. That's got to be right. But yeah, that was a good explanation, definitely. We, oh. we, we get our, uh, we get our uh, theology from... We get our theology from our hymn, That's from our true. hymn books. Yeah, uh, only to confirm what Own is saying, there's a part in Leviticus that it talks about sexual transmissions of, uh, of men. Uh, and it says, it's a wrong translation, and it says that uh, they have to sacrifice a dove for the sin. And it's not really the word sin, it's, it's something like cleansing, like what Own was talking about. Yeah, and, and my my question to Oni: Why why are you talking about uh, literal sa animal sacrifice in the future? Uh, are you you saying why am I or or no, why are you talking about that? Because uh, Paul and Apocalypse talks against that. In, in Apocalypse, which which one are you talking about? Uh, it will be uh, that there will there's not going to be any temple. And Paul strictly talks about against animal sacri no, sacrifice. Uh, which, apoc uh, which apocalypse are you talking about? Uh, the apocalypse of John. That there's not oh, going to be any you said, temple. You said Paul. No, and Paul, in, in, in his letters, he talks about against animal sacrifice. Uh, which which part uh, specifically of what Paul says? Um, that do you interpret as against uh, animal sacrifices? 
Let, so, let, 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 let me search for it. Just keep in mind, Hebrews was not written by Paul. Yes, I understand. Um, if you want to look up the verse, that would be great for, for Paul specifically. Uh, Revelation, although, speaks of two separate periods. It speaks of a millennial uh, 1,000 years, whether you view it as symbolic or not. You know, is it a 1,000-year period? After that period, then there's no temple. After the 1,000 years. Um, so I don't think that after millennial period is anytime soon. I think we're about to enter the millennium or the kingdom on earth, whether you, like Jackson might not believe it to be a literal 1,000 years, uh, but I think we're about to approach that uh, period sometime in the next 100 to 200 years in my estimation. Um, so I would say, why have a temple if you're not going to do animal sacrifices? So if, if we have enough evidence that there will be a temple built, it wouldn't make sense to not do anything inside the temple. Um, now I, I want to go back to Ezekiel for a minute, the, cause I didn't fully answer the question. Cause I kind of look at what the Essenes say about true worship and some passages in the Old Testament about the, the calves of your lips. What about that? Well, it's comparable language to, to stuff in the New Testament. You know, so there's certainly a link between the scene, the Dead Sea Scroll documents, and the New Testament writers. Uh, but the Dead Sea Scroll writers believed in the temple and animal sacrifices, and they used that language. Uh, the symbolic language of they were the temple, their prayers were sacrifices. In fact, the, the rabbis, or I shouldn't say rabbis, excuse me, uh, the Jews, um, they use comparable language, even though they believe the sacrifices are, they still have a purpose uh, in the future. Um, uh, so the thing is, what's interesting is, is I've talked about the temple scroll before and Ezekiel that section um, it presents these laws as if they are laws already revealed a lot of people think that Ezekiel's just coming out and giving new laws out of nowhere uh, but it doesn't really make sense for Ezekiel to be a new lawgiver in that capacity it's certainly possible for him to choose a new prophet to give a new law but Ezekiel was never in the function of Moses in a comparable way. So it would seem strange to introduce Ezekiel and say, okay, Ezekiel, come up with a, a new law about the temple. And what's strange is that some of his laws disagree with some of the statements in the law of Moses itself. So some people think that because of that, it's a new law. But I actually believe, there's, there's reason to believe that Ezekiel is an independent witness to the temple scroll being the original book of Deuteronomy, where the original law of Moses had laws for how to build the temple properly. And if you compare the statements, the commandments in Ezekiel with the temple scroll, there is striking agreement. The problem is that the temple scroll is fragmentary. So you're not going to find perfect agreement with everything because in the places where it would have agreed probably, those places are missing in the temple scroll in some instances. But in the places, in what we do have, it presents a very similar picture. And there's another document comparable to Ezekiel passage called the New Jerusalem text, which foretells of a future New Jerusalem, a grand Jerusalem, which is to be built and sacrifices are to be in this New uh, Jerusalem. Wait a minute one thing okay the new yeah. jerusalem text the, the title is fake there's so, never a jerusalem mentioned in the text so what would you call it just a temple I call text? it a, 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 or a, again a reminiscence policing. of the past but that's one thing that that happened when scholars dig this out and they put a title on it and this is the case with several dead sea scrolls text they make up a title that's not necessarily right 
They don't know what the title of the thing was, even if had one. And in the New Jerusalem text, there's no Jerusalem even mentioned or New Jerusalem. That's a weird thing. So I think they chose it because of the comparison with some of the stuff in Revelation. Um, and so they, they came upon that. And of course, the tradition of the belief that the, the Jews have that the temple is to be built in Jerusalem. So all that together is probably why they chose the name. Uh, but it's worth noting that the, the law probably originally did not say Jerusalem. Because, why is that? Because how else would we have the Samaritans? You know, the Samaritans built their temple in uh, Mount Gerizim. And if the original law said, build it in Jerusalem, <coughs> excuse me, then, then uh, there would be no confusion over that. If the original was more vague and didn't specify exactly where to build it, then you could see how the Samaritans would come on with their different interpretation. So I agree with you that this original document, uh, what which scholars call the New Jerusalem text, isn't necessarily referring to Jerusalem, but it is referring to a holy city where the temple, in my understanding, where the temple is supposed to reside. The See, now you're not allowing me to use that name. I don't know what else to call it. Um, 11Q or whatever it, the, the name is. Um, it actually talks about animal sacrifices uh, in that document. Um, there's striking agreements with the Temple Scroll, with the Ezekiel in that document. So I believe that Moses is the author of the so-called New Jerusalem text. Uh, we don't know for sure who is the purported or alleged author of the New Jerusalem text, but um, it's either Ezekiel or Moses. And I think it makes a lot of sense for Moses to be the one, because why would Ezekiel have two different books giving a review of the New Jerusalem or Jerusalem or whatever, uh, the holy city? it makes sense that it was an independent witness from an earlier prophet. And I think Moses fits the bill very much. And according to Deuteronomy, near the very end of his life, Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land, but he was shown by Yahweh the entire, the entire limits of the promised land. And I think when he was being shown the promised land by, by Yahweh, that was when he received that prophecy of here is the the promised land and this is how the holy the holy uh city is to be um of course that's speculation uh, on my part but i think there is a very uh, reasonable idea uh but another thing to consider the temple scroll was found in 1950s the, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in the 1940s and 1950s, not all at the same time, but in about a 10 to 15 year period, a 10 year period, basically. Um, and what's amazing about this is the guy who found it or the guy who seized it, his name is Yigiel Yadin. He is a, he was a, Israelite, a Yadin, Yadin. Yeah. He was oh, a general. Said. Yeah, he general. was a general. He was a general of the army of Israel. And during the six day war, when everything was going on, you know, everybody's killing each other. Well, no, not everybody's killing each other. Uh, but, you know, crazy wars going on. And most people during wartime are not really worrying about scrolls in a, you know, Ancient scrolls that nobody cares about buried in the ground or whatever, or, you know, in some random guy's house. You would think that the general of the Israelite army would be more preoccupied with things of more importance. And yet, during this six-day war, it was his top priority to get that scroll. He actually knew about that scroll ahead of time because... The guy who owned that scroll, who because he had found it in one of the caves, his name was Kando. He had tried to sell it to him in the past, but he tried to sell it at a way higher price than people wanted to buy it. 
But because of that, Yigi Eliadin knew about that scroll. He knew it had the temple described in it. And he thought it was so important for the history of Israel that he had to get it no matter what, even during this crazy time of war that was going on. So he actually went into the guy's house, basically stole it from Kando, seized it from him, and then gave him like, a, I don't know, like $100,000 or something as like compensation. Here you go. Uh, here's a little bit of money for you. The, um, not anywhere close to what the guy wanted. Um, but he, he took it, seized it for Israel, and then he himself uh, made a, an edition of it. He translated it into English, and he did a commentary on it, and he believed it was that important that he had to get it. And so the reason I say all that is, do we believe that the Dead Sea Scrolls were given to us by coincidence, or is there a deeper, greater purpose? Why was the Temple Scroll preserved for us? I think... It is very possible. Just consider this for those who are not really sure about a temple. If Yahweh wanted us to build a temple, it would make sense to give us the temple scroll in the last days to tell us how to build the temple, to give us clues and hints. We have enough information from the fragmentary temple scroll that we can reconstruct the basic requirements of the temple. Uh, as Yahweh wants and build it according to the specifications required. So I believe that will happen. I believe the temple scroll was given for that purpose. Uh, the war scrolls and other documents that was found. And they built a shrine in Israel called the Shrine of the Sons of Darkness and Light or something like that. Um, and I think that document is going to have a very important purpose in these final days, whether it's true prophecy or not, I think Israel is going to use it as if it's true prophecy, and they're going to use it to plan a future war that they will do against the nations. Um, and one final thing, uh, I know a lot of you guys value the Book of Enoch as scripture. The Book of Enoch actually speaks of what I consider to be three temples some people might dis disagree on that interpretation, but if you look at what Enoch says, he speaks of a first temple that was destroyed. He appears to speak of a second temple, but some may dispute uh, that there's three temples, okay? But the problem is he describes, the book of Enoch describes a temple during a time where Enoch and Elijah come back down to the earth and dwell on the earth and... Uh, enter the temple and with the righteous that is specifically in the dream visions section of the book of enoch the dream visions so be, because i value so much the book of enoch's authority read i i would encourage you guys to read that section chapter 90 chapter 89 to 90 the prophecy the dream prophecy of the animals and you can see through and you could see the oh there's the first temple Oh, here's, it seems to be the second temple. And then a final description of a temple where it says the ram that was taken up, which is clearly Elijah, and Enoch are then taken down back to the earth by one of the four archangels. And they are put into the midst of the temple with the other righteous sheep. And then the Messiah comes and they dwell in righteousness and worship in the temple. Uh, and it says that Enoch and Elijah are there before the judgment, it says. So uh, yeah, that's Ona. a long answer to a short question. Ona, yeah, I understand all those apocryphal traditions, the apocalypse of Elijah, and, and all these legends about the Antichrist, uh, about the end of the world and the temple. So were you talking about the sacrifice of animals uh, after the end of the world and in the new millennium? Or were you talking about it before? I believe the sacrifices will return uh, somewhat before the 
Antichrist comes onto the scene. Ah, because I believe that too. And, 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 and the Jews will do it. It will also be during the 1,000 years, in my understanding. Ah, okay, okay. So, so, uh, uh, and then, and then after the 1,000 years, there will be no more sacrifices for the rest of eternity. But where do you get that? What's your source? Because I understand that even though Hebrews wasn't written by Paul, Hebrews was part of early Christianity. And you don't see Paul nor the first Christians sacrificing animals on the apocryphal acts of Paul doing that. And in Hebrews 10.4, 10.14. That's the part that I was talking about. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. And you see in the, in the, the, the Scalia that uh, Deuteronomy was written uh, strictly for the Jews because it was after they were worshiping the golden calf. Um, okay, so, yeah, that's, so according to... There is some disagreement of some of these documents, uh, apocryphal documents, but from what I can tell, originally there was a priesthood, uh, according to these books like Jubilees and such. Uh, Enoch, well, Second Enoch, uh, Laverne knows some of, of Second Enoch. Uh, Enoch gave, gives laws of how to do sacrifices properly. Um, and then Noah, according to the Book of Jubilees, was a priest and, and had actually laws for how to do sacrifices properly. Then Abraham was taught the laws of sacrifice. And Abraham passed it down to Isaac. And then Isaac, we know, passed it down to Levi. And then Levi was chosen to be the origin of the Levitical priesthood. According to the Testament of Levi in the Book of Jubilees, he was chosen. What we see is that originally sacrifices were not for sin offerings. Sacrifices were, or, you know, purification offerings. Uh, sacrifices were more for, uh, well, let's see here. Um, after the flood, Noah did a sacrifice of atoning for the earth. Okay, so he did that. Then throughout the history, they just do sacrifices out of a desire to worship. According to the apostolic constitutions, Abraham and others did sacrifices not out of a requirement, but out of a desire of love and worship towards a voluntary act of righteousness. And, but then there are specific examples where God comes down and commands a certain sacrifice to be done. So the patriarchs would obey. And... Before the golden calf incident, there was the Passover. And the Passover is regarded as a sacrifice, a lamb. Um, and so what I can tell is that... But are you reading, are you reading Hebrews 10, 18? Where it uh, says, and where these have been forgiven sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. It's strictly talking about animal sacrifice. Uh, Josephus talks about that. Baptism was for impurity and for sins. There were some baptize, baptizements for purity and others for sins. And, and it's always like one thing's for sin and one thing's for purity or for cleansing. And I, I, I read Hebrews 10, 18, and for me, it's talking about animals, even though it says sin. So I accept Hebrews' authority. Um, but I have to remind you that all the writings of the New Testament, the, primarily the letters, are the understanding of other believers like you and I. You and I might be faithful. I would actually, I don't feel I'm really, I wouldn't call myself faithful in the sense I believe is required for salvation. Yeah, but let's just, for sake of discussion, let's just say both you and I are faithful. That doesn't mean we are correct in our beliefs and everything we believe. But the first Christians never sacrificed. That's, that's my point. I'm they sorry, say it again? The first Christians never sacrificed animals. Right, you have to ask why that is. And, and so there's a couple reasons from what I've seen is that sacrifices are for Israelites, in my understanding, not for Gentiles. So that's one of the main reasons. Second reason is only the priests, the Levitical priests could do animal sacrifices. And 
most of the Christians were not were not Levitical priests. Uh, uh, but uh, but the the first followers of Christ of of, of Christ they were strictly Jews. They, uh, they weren't pagans. Right, but the temple was destroyed, and uh, you you could not build your own altar because according to the law that uh, that was regarded as a high place. You know, all throughout the books of Kings, when they when they did their own altars, those mm. were the, that was regarded it, as it was wrong yeah. as sinful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so ba they basically believed that the temple was destroyed as an act of judgment and God rejecting the sacrifices of Israel. There's many prophets who speak of the rejection of Israel's sacrifices. It's not because the sacrifices are no longer important. It's because those sacrifices were done in an impure way. So if you're doing impure sacrifices, on, on it. So what it would be sense. your uh, um, interpretation of this text? Hebrews 10, 18. Uh, can you read your version? Uh, I, I'll answer this, but then I did want to talk about one other topic on an unrelated subject that Jackson brought up earlier. So I, I, I put it on, on the chat. Oh, okay. You put it in the chat. Well, I don't really uh, like the, the new international version. Um, but that, 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 that's good according to, to scholars like uh, Craig Evans. Well, you have, to, you, have to com you have to compare different translations and uh, even just because it's a, a acceptable translation uh, for practical reasons, it may not always correctly uh, render what the text says. So there's other versions that say, I don't know if this is the, the verse, well, you... First of all, you said ten fourteen, but you're quoting verse eighteen. Ah, because it starts talking about it like before the eighteen. Which verse are we talking about? Fourteen, uh, 10, or, 10, eight, 18. Or, or eighteen, or eighteen. Okay. 18. okay. Um, because if this is the verse I'm thinking of, another version says, um, "Sacrifice for sin is obsolete." Uh, I don't but, know if it's the but, same verse. Uh, but, but that would be like irrelevant. But uh, do you think it's talking about animal sacrifice? Because I do. Yes, it's, talk it's talking about uh, animal sacrifice. But not all sacrifices under the law were, were for sin. So uh, the, the golden calf sacrifices were added as a punishment according to the apostolic constitutions specifically as a reminder to worship the one true God. So Think about this. Look at what the law says. It says at each of the festivals, they had to do all these ridiculous number of sacrifices. According to the temple scroll, for each holy festival, there were like yeah, dozen, but, but, dozens but we, of sacrifices. But right now we're talking about post-Christ. We, we can't think about those. No, I, I'm, trying to ex I'm trying to explain. So um, the – I'm trying to explain uh, – what, why the sacrifices were given. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't find any animal sacrifice in early Christianity nor in the Apocrypha. That's because it was taken away because the temple was destroyed and the priesthood was destroyed because the Jew, the, the, the Levitical priests were scattered. Uh, yeah, I understand. But there, there's some fragments like from Abionites and like and Tetrin, like, like, like really Jewish... Those Jewish Christians? They're all heretics. They're all heretics. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, but they have, they, 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 they're Jewish Christians, so, so we can't dismiss everything. And, Can you call them and they, nev they, nev they, nev they never talk about animals, animal sacrifice. They're not Christians if they don't believe that Christ is the Messiah. Uh, I, yes, I understand. Well, they can't be Christians. Um, well, well I'm, I'm not nobody like to, to judge them. If they're not Christians or not, because uh, only well, God me, can save let me, them. Let me say something. Even though they're heretics. So I don't, I don't get into the uh, specifics of who's a Christian and who's not, because the thing is, the way I define a Christian is someone who claims to be a follower of the Messiah. Because if you, if you choose the definition of who is a Christian, as like some people basically take it to mean who is saved. Someone is a Christian if they are a saved person. Um, but I think it's a problematic definition. Uh, 
you know, an Israelite is an Israelite regardless of whether they're righteous or unrighteous uh, or uh, a heretic Israelite. So in regards to Christians, I think a simple definition is simply someone who professes faith in in Christ, in Yeshua yeah. as the Messiah, but that does not mean that they will enter eternal life. Uh, uh, but that, but, we, but, but we're, we're not anybody like to, to, to say that. Uh, that's up to God. Uh, uh, talking about those early like Jewish Jewish Christian traditions, like the Clementine homilies, mm -hmm. strictly Jewish Christians, and they never talk about uh, animal sacrifice neither. So I'll, I'll say, I'm going to save my final view on it, and then we'll move to a different topic. Okay. Um, so my view on it is that uh, I believe that there were prophecies. There's actually a bunch of extra books. A lot of there's there's a lot of Hartford documents cor corroborating things I'm saying. There may be some things that might be discrepancies, but everything I'm saying can be corroborated by at least some Apocrypha documents or even Old Testament documents as well. And basically, my understanding is that the some of the sacrifices were given to teach a lesson of of uh, worshiping only the one the one true God and when the Messiah came, he came at a time when the temple was polluted the priesthood was illegitimate. The uh, Sanhedrin, uh, not San, Sanhedrin, the uh, Sadducees had had uh, stolen the high priesthood, and they were no longer in the line of Levi. A according to the Testament of Levi, it gives a prophecy of the high priesthoods. And around the seventh or eighth high priesthood uh, jubilee, it becomes invalid, and there's no more valid priests from then on out. On no more Levitical valid priests because they were so abominable in in god's eyes because they were so unlawful mm. so because they were the priesthood was rejected and then what did they do they defiled the temple and the holy city of israel by murdering the messiah according to the damascus document it says because the teacher of righteousness i'm paraphrasing because the teacher of righteousness, I interpret that as the Messiah. Some people interpret it as John the Baptist and other people. But because the teacher of righteousness was murdered, the about 40 years later, uh, the temple would be destroyed as a, as a punishment from God uh, because of how evil they were. So their sacrifices were taken away not because... It was no longer needed, but because they were so wicked, uh, it was a punishment. They were no longer allowed to do sacrifices. Uh, this was to show them how far they had fallen from God, that they were no longer holy, because sacrifices were all about holiness. So basically it was God saying, you are no longer my holy people. I am cutting you off, casting you away. And, and ever since then, they've been cast out from the Holy Land for 2,000 years. But according to Paul, he said the, the bringing in of the Gentiles needs to happen in order for Israel to be restored. So once the, the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled, then Israel will be restored. And so it appears to be that the time of the Gentiles has basically come to an end. I mean, in, in the sense that, they, that it has been fulfilled. Um, and now, the steps are in place to bring back Israel. And so Israel is being brought back. And because Israel is being brought back, it needs to be purified first, made holy, because right now Israel is a abomination in many ways. It needs to be purified. I believe that will happen when the Israelites uh, will repent, enough of them, and take control. Build the third temple according to the, to the temple scroll and Ezekiel and the Solomon Temple requirements, and then uh, they will be doing animal sacrifices not for, uh, for for forgiveness of sins, but for holiness of their bodies. And in regards to the letter of Hebrews, I'll have to another time uh, do a commentary on certain verses. 
Um, we could do that a separate time, you and me, or in, in you know, next week or something. Yeah, on, on it, but you would have to give us a source, a uh, New Testament source uh, for animal sacrifice. <coughs> not, not, not an Old Testament source. Um, well, there's some Apocrypha. That doesn't there's, speak there's least, about that. There's at least two New Testament Apocrypha books which say sacrifices will return. Or at uh, least, uh, which or, ones? Or at there's least a the temple. section in the homilies and the recognition <coughs> they talk about this very thing, but they talk about it from the perspective of why sacrifices were in the first place and why they're not anymore. Yeah, no longer. That's the only thing I can think of in there. But, but, but only saying that, that it will be, but so there's there, no there's source. A, there, so there's a document called the Gospel of the, the Gospel and Revelation of the Apostles. Uh, and in one of the prophecies attributed to the Apostle James, he has a vision of a, the temple being built in the latter days. And like I said, why would a temple uh, be built? Uh, uh, you got to watch out that there's a, a fake one. You uh, have what, to what, dig what, deep what? for that one, brother. I'm uh, sorry, what? You, you had the, to dig deep for that one. The, the, there's, there's a fake one on it, the one you're no. talking about. No, it's called the Gospel and Apocalypse. It's not the Gospel. The tw uh, and each one of them? Um, no, it only has three. I got to see it because there's a fake one. I know. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not talking about the fake one, the the, the Essene, Ebionite one. I'm talking mm, about. Um, you got to give me the source. Yeah, it's a, I'm, it's I'm a, not, it's and I know a lot of, about apocrypha. It's in Syriac, um, and then there's another document, the. Ethiopian Book of Clement also preserved in Arabic manuscripts and it purports to give prophecies of the rise of Islam, Constantine, yeah, yeah, yeah. But and in, the, and in that, that it prophesies of a temple being built in the latter days. Yeah, I understand that it talks about a temple and I believe about the temple and the Antichrist and all of that, but it never talks about, uh, about uh, Christians, believers uh, doing animal sacrifice. Because it's Israelites, not Christians, who do the sacrifices. But the, the, uh, Let's no. move on to a different topic. Yes, um, yes. Uh, you got to give me the, the sources so I can check them out. Uh, Jackson, I'm going to let you talk for some time here. But I wanted to talk about uh, what you touched upon earlier in regards to the chronology of, of uh of Moses and the Pharaoh, like when, uh, when the yeah. Israelites were in Egypt? Because I have a theory on that, but you mentioned it earlier. So how about you share a little bit more on that? Well, it's about, they, they give Moses, according to the Tanakh and the uh, chronology of Usher, I guess, that Moses came along 200 years after Akhenaten. That would be somewhere around 1550 to 1650 BC. But there are autodidacts, auto scholars that have now dug deeper than that and they're placing either Joseph in the retinue of Akhenaten or Moses as Akhenaten. We remember that in the book of Jasher, I don't know if you give that any credence or not, but it tells us that Moses was the king of Cush for 30 years during that time that he supposedly disappeared and that he was a, a ruler in Egypt, but he was hired by the Cushites to come down and be their king and lasted there a long time. So that chronology in there is questionable. We did a series of probably 10 different podcasts They're on YouTube now with Allison Gary, who got into that whole issue and went through a number of those newer scholars and uh, ac actually biblical explorers to try to come up with a better timeline at that time. And there are so ca many characteristics of the Akhenatanist temple and religion that Joseph was uh, 
of the Jewish Joseph that they're thinking that he was probably the viceroy of Akhenaten. Because there you've got the temple there with all the storage bins. There's another theory that extends that a couple hundred more years and brings Moses back a couple hundred years to being Akhenaten himself. And look, sounds like a crazy theory, but it, you have to look at the evidence. You have to look at the evidence. We have a trouble getting out of our own belief system, out of our own mindset. For many of us, it's been beaten into us through the church and religion and religious groups that this is so and nothing else. But there are, in fact, when I put down some of these theories, uh, pe some people write back comments that, you know, you're crazy or you're an unbeliever or something like this. And I'm just trying to show them there's alternative ideas about these things that are not necessarily lining up with old scholarship. So that's all I wanted to say. If you want to, if you want to listen to those and want to get enlightened a lot, each one of those presentations are 50 minutes. And you can find them at youtube1.org. I'll just say that because I don't want to go on with this much longer. But it, she goes into great detail on this. And I do a few of these too. Who's great she? Detail. Allison Gary. Oh, okay. She was a star for a while, doing really well. And, of course, she's off for a while because she's taking care of a, a, an elderly mother. But those are enlightening when it comes to that particular time. Amen. You ready for another question? Um, I wanted to share uh, my perspective okay. on that. Uh, um, I wanted to say... Um, for my view of when the, when the Israelites were in Egypt, um, I found an interesting thing. It could be just coincidence, but I do know that I believe the Father has a sense of humor in his predestination of history. And so this could be a hint to us of when the Exodus was. So according to a lot of scholarship, the Hyksos were the Israelites, and Josephus was the first one to to say this and um evidence for the hyksos would be they were a semitic people and um it's the best explanation of a people being cast out because the hyksos were eventually expelled from from uh, egypt uh now there's some inconsistencies like um they didn't all leave at the same time so but that could be reconciled with the idea that when the Israelites left Egypt, that they didn't all leave Egypt. Um, the, other, the, the other thing is that the numbers is an issue. According to the Torah, um, 600,000 male adult Israelites left Egypt, <clears throat> not counting women and children. I actually don't believe that. Um, we could talk about that in a sec. Yeah, uh, I don't mind. Um, so, <clears throat> let's see, what was I saying? Um, was anyone paying attention to what I was saying in the yes, last Yes, yes, uh, you were talking about <laughs> the, 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 the amount of people that... Okay, went, yeah, the all right, thank you. <laughs> um, so basically, I believe it's been altered by 10. So instead of 600 and whatever, 80,000, I forget the exact number, I believe it was um, 68,000. Uh, and each, each of the tribal numbers in the book of Numbers and Exodus have been multiplied by 10. Um, and that, the reason I believe that is because according to the scholars of his history, there's no evidence that such a large group of people could have left at that time, especially considering the fact that other nations in that time period, like Egypt and such, had much smaller armies, which suggests a smaller population. So it would be highly unlikely for Egypt to have a small population, but for Israel to be so huge. Um, 
So I think that's, that's my theory of a, of a 10 thing, but who, um, which Pharaoh was the Pharaoh of Egypt uh, when they left uh, during the Exodus? We'll get ready for this. So Moses, right? Moses is a Greek rendering of an Egyptian name, Mose, Mose. And many Egyptians had Moses or Mose as part of their name. Moses means like uh, descended from, uh, like a son. Or it means baby. Yeah, so, yeah son of. A child. Like, yeah, and, and, and so there is this one pharaoh named Yah Mose. Ya Moses, which is yeah. which is Ya Moses, and what, so what that according to the scholars that name means, Ya is born. Now Ya is the Egyptian moon god. The the the, uh, the Egyptians worshipped the moon under the name Ya, and they used the word Moses or Mose as part of that person's name. Um, so this pharaoh was named. Yah Moses. So it would be really funny and coincidence that Moses with Yah, with his God Yah, was confronting Pharaoh Yah Moses with his uh, God Yah. It would be yeah. like a mockery of Yah Moses. Not only that, but Yah Moses. It says this on uh, Wikipedia. Um, let's see here. According to the scholars, Yah Moses is the one who completed the conquest and expulsion of the Hyksos from the Nile Delta. Yeah. Res he restored Theban rule over the whole of Egypt and successfully reasserted Egyptian power in its formerly subject territories of Nubia and Canaan. So this seems strangely coincidental that Yah Moses, the Pharaoh, uh, cast out the Hyksos. According to scholars, the Hyksos are the Israelites. So Yah Moses cast out the Israelites. And it just so happens that according to the Bible, the Israelites' leader was Moses and his God was Yah. So I find that I find that coincidence to be very striking. That's enough of a coincidence to convince me that that Pharaoh is the Pharaoh of the uh, Exodus uh, of Israel. So anyways, that's my theory. Um, Allison covers that very thing. I, I think that the Hyksos are a little early, but not necessarily so. I think the Hy Hyksos were around Oh, at about the, the turn of the century there, the um, 13th century, turn of the century. Might be a little early, but that's another one of the big theories of these days concerning Moses and that whole milieu at that time. Laverne wants to talk about a controversial topic, but uh, All right, Laverne, I think we it. should uh, talk about it. We, we only have uh, about 10 minutes left, but we will try to talk about this a little bit. Okay, can I make an observation about it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I know a lot of people thought that Trump was, uh, you know, chosen by God, and there were a lot of prophets prophesying it. In fact, uh, I believe when you look at around the world and the different languages, there were probably hundreds of them. They're still prophesying it. Yeah, well, there's, yeah, there's still um, people. And gobs, and gobs. Yeah. But I yeah. thought all leaders well, were let, chosen. Well, let I thought finish God decides his, uh, all of them. Let him, let him finish first, and then... Uh, well, okay, my I observation... Was just saying my, that I thought they all were. Yeah. Uh, you think Mo, uh, God chose Nero? Yeah, Just bad God. and good, um, we'll, we'll even pharaohs and we'll everything. We'll address that all. after. Let, let Laverne finish what okay. he understands. Okay, I'm sorry. It's all right. Yeah. Okay. My, my, okay, my point is that there were a lot of so-called prophets prophesying, saying that Jesus appeared to me and told me this, that, and the other thing about Trump. God told me. I heard God tell me this about Trump. There are those who said, you know, use the words like uh God saith, and they give a prophecy about Trump. 
I believe what happened was God showing just the extent of the false prophets, not only in the United States, but in the world at large, by allowing them to prophesy these things about Trump and then having Trump lose. I believe that's a great theory. I believe I, I seriously believe it's God shedding a light on both false prophets and false churches. I, I, this is going back years ago, about 10 or 12 years ago, I made a video explaining that God had revealed to me that he would be tearing down the false churches, the heretical churches. And I believe this is him doing it uh, in a way that just exposes these false prophets. And these are serious sins that these prophets were, uh, were committing. This is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. To say that the Holy Spirit gave me this message, to say that God told me this, and then they speak in the name of God, this is seriously blaspheming God and the Holy Spirit. And I believe God allowed all of this to happen for the past six years, really. And now he's, by having Trump being defeated, it's showing just how corrupt the, uh, the modern uh, mainstream Christianity is. Um, so, yeah, I like to hear what you guys think. Uh, you know, if you have a different take on it, then, uh, um, you know, share that too. But that's, that's what I believe happened. So um, I, I wanted to say, first of all, uh, that uh, Laverne, does not uh, disagree with prophets. prophets. Uh, the concept of prophets, like new people being prophets, um, he's only uh, specifically addressing these particular prophets and prophecies as false. Um, I say that because th we had a, uh, I don't remember when this was, but there was a whole discussion about whether, you know, the gifts of the Spirit and prophecy is one of them. And I think every, everyone on this call believes in the gift of prophecy. There's no question that, that uh, the Holy Spirit can and does come to some people and give them uh, prophetic uh, words. But um, the fact is, some people are false prophets. According to, the, according to the law of Moses, we are to test prophets. Every prophet, even even righteous prophets, we must test them first. Once they are established, then we, we're still to keep testing them throughout their prophetic career. But um, so basically, the primary test for these prophets prophesying about Trump would be to see if their prophecies come true. If they do not come true, then they it is evident false they, are false, they are false prophets. My gosh, and you know, some of these so-called prophets, I could, I could name off a dozen right now that make these predictions and say, this is the word of the Lord. They do this over and over and over again, yet they still have a big audience. I thought if a person wants to have a big audience somewhere in public, all you have to do is lie your head off. Lie well, off the time. The the problem is it's it's become watered down of what it means to be prophecy in yeah. the sense of um, I believe God told me um, I, I believe God sent sent me something. So the problem is um, it becomes watered down to a point where well I, if I'm wrong then I wasn't really prophesying I was only yeah. Yeah. predicting. Um, and so actually what's interesting, I think I mentioned this another time, but uh, another teaching recently, but uh, according, what's interesting is the Septuagint translates certain false, uh, certain false prophets as pseudo prophetess or something, mm -hmm. whatever the Greek word is, pseudo. Yeah, is this means word. false. Yes, they use that right. word, but guess what? In the Hebrew, in the Masoretic text, Dead Sea Scrolls, there is no word uh, false prophet. There is one. Uh, there's one place in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which it says the prophets who spoke lies or whatever. 
but it never speaks of a false prophets. It always speaks of prophets. Um, so in the book of Jeremiah, every false prophet is called prophet so-and-so, which tells me that a prophet is anyone who basically makes a prediction. Uh, it's basically anyone who makes a prediction. So, um, but not all predictions make you bad for being wrong. Specifically, you are in the wrong in a sinful way when you claim that the prediction you're making comes from a divine communication to you from God himself. That's where you err if you're wrong. Um, but if you, if, but for me, for example, I've studied scripture and I see a lot of things in scripture that seem to say certain prophecies will come to pass. So I could tell people, according to the scripture, as I understand it, these things will happen. In a sense, that makes me a prophet in that, in that ancient sense of predicting. But I am not claiming to have communication and, um, with, with God. I am not saying that my words came from a uh, revelation to me. All I'm saying is someone else said this, and I believe what they said. So that's an important distinction. Um, but it's the, the people themselves who say what they said is the word of God that has been divinely revealed to them through, through uh, the gift of the Spirit. That's when I think you enter dangerous territory. According to the letter of James, it says, not many should presume to be teachers because they will be judged more harshly. If that's the case for teachers, how much more is it the case for prophets, predictors? Not many should be predictors or prophets because you will be judged more harshly um, if you claim no. that something well, is from God. Paul said it's better to be a prophet than to be uh, speaking in tongues or interpreting tongues or what else did he say? He was talking about something else, but he said that you should try to prophesy. Well, Didn't that's he? a spiritual gift. You, I think he said. I think he said you should. Uh, you basically basically fast and ask God to give you the, the it's ability. It's a better gift, no doubt about that. When when you fast and uh, you often have dreams and visions, so uh, looks like our Laverne may have left us. I grew up oh. in a charismatic community. Oh, there he is. No, oh, never mind. He's he still is. there. Yeah. He's still there. And, uh, I and still, you know, I'm, I all believe right. in my charismatic gifts and I practice them and I have all my life. However, like this Trump thing, I want Trump to be president as much as anybody else. Well, not, not some people on this call. Christians of every sort, whether they're really practicing or not, that God told them to tell me this, that, and the other thing. And God, you know, God told them to tell me that I need to do this or that or the other thing. People that are not engaged in any kind of ministry other than just telling people what God told them that uh, they should do. Now, Laverne, I hope that you put that up there on the think tank site because that is a very, very good insight. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say, um, so there was one thing that Melissa said earlier. I want to speak about it, but then, you know, we're, we're getting to our, our time where we're, where we're about to end, but I do want to wrap it up and say this. Um, there is a sense where all leaders were, are chosen by God in a sense of predestination, because I believe that everything is predestined, even the bad things. So, for example, you know, the the ultimate bad ruler would, you know, Hitler, uh, but a bunch of other, you know, uh, Kim Jong-un um, and the ancient Roman emperors, they were all chosen by God for a purpose. And you're a Calvinist? Um, I'm not a Calvinist. I'm Shame just, on you. A <laughs> senior. Don't you believe in free will? Um, I believe in will, uh, not necessarily 
completely free, but I believe in a form of free will. Um, basically, uh, I, I, I see, I'm hoping Laverne comes back here because I wanted him to hear what I was saying, but, uh, yeah, where did he go? Well, he seems to have a loose connection, maybe. Oh. Um, basically, it is my understanding that I, I liked some of what Trump was doing, but not everything. I did not vote for him in either the first or second election because there were things that I strongly disagree with him on. But I think he was chosen for a purpose in his time. His time, it appears, is now past. We don't know for sure, but it seems to be the case. He, his time has passed, and he has done some amazing good things, but he has also done some, what I believe, not everyone may agree with this, but I think he's done some damage, um, some harm. So uh, I agree with Laverne that um, I, th I think Laverne can be right, and yet God could have still used Trump to accomplish some righteous purpose. So he can do the, that, the same thing can happen at the same time. So a person can be chosen by God to do both a important righteousness, but also to punish people and expose their wickedness um so yeah that, that i that's what i wanted to say and uh i'll have to message laverne or something all right uh, so thank he's gone. you all for joining tonight and you must be a little tired tonight andrew <laughs> you did double duty tonight uh, sorry sorry for talking too much oh it's, it was good we'll send you five dollars as an honorarium no. <laughs> and thank you all for coming on, and we'll be back again Friday. Don't forget the service tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. Got a good preacher on tomorrow, and I'll see you then. Anyone have more questions, post it on Facebook. Shalom. Okay. Okay. Shalom. Thanks, everybody. Bye. -bye. <laughs> see you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.